today it is our huge honor to be speaking with Jared C. Wilson. Jared Wilson is Assistant Professor of Pastoral Ministry at Spurgeon College, also author in residence at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and Director of the Pastoral Training Center at Liberty Baptist Church in Kansas City. Uh, Jared Wilson is also author of the text that we'll be discussing today, The Gospel-Driven Church, Uniting Church Growth Dreams with the Metrics of Grace, available from Zondervan in 2019. Jared, we're really thankful to be speaking with you tonight. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me. Jared, if I may, the first question I should ask is, what does it mean for a church to be gospel-driven? Yeah, it's a really important question, isn't it? Especially in this day of gospel-centered this and gospel saturated that and uh the 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 jargon can kind of take over sometimes and the sloganeering and we lose the uh the the substance of it um just as a basic definition essentially what it means is that a church is making sure that everything that it does is uh influenced by um directed from the finished work of jesus christ to get a little bit deeper um, than that, as I like to think pastorally for ministers, is essentially means um, that they are regularly um, asking themselves in sort of a spirit of discernment, whether they are leaning on the weight of the gospel, the Holy Spirit working through the good news of Jesus Christ, or they're leaning on their own wisdom, um, their own ambition, their own creativity, their own production skills, all those sorts of things. It doesn't mean any of those things are bad. Those other things are, are, are wrong to use. But I think most ministers who are, are um, self-evaluative enough, honest with themselves, can be able to come to a point of saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trusting in myself for the results of this ministry, or I really am trusting that the, the gospel is, is the power for my ministry. That's sort of the premise behind gospel-driven is that really the gospel is the only power that um, we've been stewarded, um, not as a magical force, but as the Holy Spirit working through the foolishness of this message of Christ's death and resurrection and all the things that, that entails. Um, yeah, so there's some major implications for ministry for that. And the three that I kind of you know highlight, um, like with my residents and things like that, is to say, it, if somebody asks you, what's the point of this whole gospel-centered thing? Like, how do you measure that or how does that impact the work of ministry say first of all how you understand the bible so um are you teaching preaching or even just in your personal study of, of the scriptures are you seeing christ as the center of it is, is he the point of the sermon that you're preaching is he the point of the lesson that you're teaching in that small group or equipping group um of your personal study are you looking for christ even in the old testament that's one of the biggest implications of, of gospel drivenness or gospel centrality. The other is understanding how people change. Like how, how do you answer the question? How is it that people change? And most of us tend to think just naturally, it makes total sense. It's intuitive um, that the way people change is when you tell them, to, <laughs> you tell them how, or you tell, you, you tell them to change and maybe you give them some steps on how to do it. And those are all important things. Those are things the Bible has. There's plenty of imperatives in, in, in the Bible. But the gospel center paradigm comes to say, look, actually the way people change, at least the, the kind of change Christianity is interested in, which is that hearts of stone become hearts of flesh and that uh, saints, believers become more conformed to the image of Christ is actually through the gospel. Titus uh, chapter two, Paul says it's the grace of God that has appeared and it's training us to renounce ungodliness. Paul in second Corinthians chapter three says it's by beholding the glory of Christ that we are transformed from one degree of glory into another. So how people change is the second big component. And then thirdly, just for your own validation and confidence. So for the ministry leader, uh, missionary, pastor, professor, for the Christian, where are they finding their daily, um, their daily affirmation, their daily uh, approval, so to speak? Is it in their performance? So for ministers who are doing church, they're basing their success or their worth or their validation on usually how the church is doing and how the church is doing is a really important thing to think about and to be even concerned about, but your validation should never be there. It should be in God's approval of you in Christ. So those are the three kind of big implications, I think of, of gospel drivenness that kind of flesh it out. So we understand really what the, uh, what the import is. 
really grateful for your reflection. And uh, Jared, many denominations and churches are reporting uh, declining demographics. In in your view, what is it that what is the greatest set of challenges that our churches are facing today? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because my answer, I think, ties into what people tend to be doing to uh, forestall that decline. <laughs> so I think some of the things that we do to address th- that issue, um, people not interested in church, basically, or people dropping out of church, um, I think some of the, the major ways, you know, evangelicals, particularly in, in the West, particularly in America, have tried to address that actually exacerbate the problem. Um, we were now 30 years, almost 40 years into um, sort of the, the church growth movement that came out of, um, yeah, just the, the sort of, as a reaction to kind of um, fundamentalism and, and, you know, kind of the traditionalist way of doing church. There were some people who, who, who very wisely and compassionately discovered that lost people weren't interested in how uh, church was being done. The church wasn't effectively reaching the lost. And so they began to design church itself, the worship gathering in particular, around the seekers. So thus came the, uh, the rise of the seeker-sensitive church, the seeker-targeted um, movement. And we're still kind of dealing with that today. And so 30, 40 years on, what we're seeing is that um, it's not exactly working. It's one of the worst-kept secrets in, in evangelicalism, I think. Uh, we still have a dropout rate of those who were raised in church of about 70%. Um, the number of baptisms um, in, in, in every evangelical denomination is in decline. Um, the number of professing Christians, of course, is in decline. And there's a lot, there's, so, there's a million factors that, that go into that. Um, just even population fluctuations and um, diversity, uh, you know, all sorts of things that affect that. So it's not simply ineffective churches. But, um, but by and large, what we have done to address that issue isn't really addressing the issue. And so there's even research I use in the book uh, Sally Morgenthaler, who was one of the early proponents of um, what she called worship evangelism. She wrote a book called Worship Evangelism. And she was one who would travel around and kind of consult and speak on this idea of orienting your worship gathering specifically to reach seekers. And what she discovered through her time doing that and compiling more research and just um, experience is that it really wasn't working. In fact, most pastors who were um, enacting that model were discovering um, that they weren't reaching the number of unchurched people that they thought they were. And by and large, the people occupying those churches uh, tend to leave within about four to seven years, depending on life stage. Um, and so what we're looking at is the things that are often used, the challenges, to go back to the original question, it, I think it's still consumerism and pragmatism. Those are the two primary um, issues that the American church in particular, uh, American evangelicals, need to face head on and it manifests itself in um uh, of churches of all kinds it's not just the kind of you know fog and lasers attractional church that's dealing in that stuff there are very conservative or traditional or formal churches that are um that have embraced a consumeristic sort of ethos um, because they've discovered they've discovered that their market is people who like traditional you know informal worship services so it, it doesn't come from a place of principle or, th- or theology. It comes from what does the customer want? And sometimes the customer in, in a given area uh, wants the very informal, you know, jeans and spiked hair and, f- you know, smoke on the stage. Sometimes the customer wants the choir and the, and the big kind of formal production. And so it's still an embrace of consumerism. And then pragmatism, I think, impacts um, almost every evangelical ministry. It is the constant pool. Uh, of every pastor, which is essentially that we lean into the works of the flesh to attract people, um, or we, we're trusting in our eloquence, our creativity, our whatever, uh, um, to do the work that only the gospel can do. Uh, this book is all about the gospel. We're getting there. There's still more bad news before we can appreciate the good <laughs> news. Um, so I was looking over a, uh, an article by Christianity Today last March it came out. The article is titled The Church Growth Gap, The Big Get Bigger While the Small Get Smaller. And it, this article from Christianity Today cited a statistic that the majority, that is 50 per seven, excuse me, 57 percent of American churches now have fewer than 100 attendees each Sunday. What's your view 
Jared, can the traditional model of church sustain as we look to the future? Yeah, I mean, I think it can. Whether it will, um, you know, certainly remains to be seen. Um, I, I think there's just so many factors that play into um, how church is done in certain regions. I mean, you look at um, places like, um, you know, like New England, for instance, which is, you know, has in the last five, 10 years replaced the Pacific Northwest as the least church region of the nation. And what some are saying is there's sort of a quiet revival there, right? So it's still least church region. Um, and yet, and yet, um, uh, as um, Mary Eberstad and others have shown, uh, the conservative churches are growing there, or, or at least um, are not in decline as the main line and, and, and other churches are. Um, and so there seems to be this, this sort of slow rebounding, right? We're not seeing, um, you know, big explosive growth or church, uh, the kind of church planning movements we might see in, in, um, in Asia or, or what have you. Um, but there's a number of church plants that are, that are cropping up. Um, you're seeing in a lot of non-white um, uh, um, congregations that are flourishing there sometimes, um, you know, that's why it's sometimes called the quiet revival because they don't get the press that, um, you know, that Anglo churches do. Um, and so uh, w wherever you have people who really feel called to a mission and feel called to um, uh, each other, um, I think you have the, the right foundation for that quote unquote traditional model um, you know, I don't think it's going away, and I, I think it can be sustained as long as there are people who are willing to, uh, who are willing to support it. And I, the, the money's there. I, I don't have the stats um, in terms of you know giving percentages and and what have you. But every time you look at um, how much evangelicals give to their church, um, you, you you tend to see that we have a lot of ground to make up. We could do a, a lot more in terms of poverty relief and other things. And certainly, if we wanted to, we could um, keep the lights on and the doors open uh, for most of our churches. But gosh, the, there are churches declining and, and closing doors every day as well. And there's probably multiple reasons for that. Sometimes even faithful churches, um, you know, have to, um, you know, go that route. So there's just so many contingencies involved. But I, I just don't think we're in this region, you know, um, in America, I don't think the traditional model is going away anytime soon. Um, you know, old habits die hard here, even as things change, the more things change, they, they, they stay the same. And, uh, it's remarkable that in, in almost no, you know, no matter what kind of church you go into just about, just about, there are, you know, always, you know, outliers and innovators, but from the most contemporary, you know, mega church to the kind of avant-garde quasi, you know, there's always people singing songs and a guy who gets up and talks. <laughs> and so there's something about that that just dies hard. We know we're not. Um, and, and I think for good reason. And I'm glad that that, you know, would die hard. But it's so common. It's so ubiquitous that it, it'd be strange to see it going away anytime soon. Jared, we're really grateful for your reflections. In your view, what's the future of the megachurch movement? Yeah, you know, I go one of two ways on this. So a couple of years ago, I think it was, I think it was two years ago, I wrote two pieces of back-to-back -back, um, uh, blog posts at my blog at the Gospel Coalition. And the first was um, why I think the, the attractional church, um, and in particular the attractional megachurch, um, is, uh, um, will be going away, like why it's in decline or why it will decline. And I listed some reasons that I could, you know, foresee um, as, as sort of the end of the megachurch movement. And then the next day I post an article on sort of, you know, not so fast, <laughs> all the reasons why uh, it's probably going to be here for a while. And so I kind of go back and forth on this. And what's interesting is there's so many shifts within the movement and there's so many different kinds of megachurches, right? So statistically, the number of megachurches is still... Um, a vast minority of the number of churches. It's, uh, I just saw stats, I think today or yesterday from the Southern Baptist convention. Um, and the number of churches more than 2000, uh, is like 0.5%. So 0.5% of all churches is more than 2000. I, I would venture to guess that outside the SBC and just the wider evangelical world, it's probably, a, you know, one to 2%, maybe, maybe a little bit higher. Um, uh, I'm not sure, but it's still statistically, the number of um, the vast majority of churches 
tend to be uh, what we would call small churches, but really normative size churches. So they tend to be certainly less than 500 and probably in the 100 to 200 size range. And yet, um, the number of mega churches seems to be increasing, at least the last time I checked. Again, they're not statistically, you know, blowing everybody out of the water yet in terms of the, you know, their numbers, but they are growing. And so there's some who think that there's a consolidation taking place. So as nominal Christianity kind of begins to waste away, even in the Bible Belt, um, you're beginning to see kind of cultural Christianity erode. I don't think it'll ever quite go away, especially in the South. Um, but as that kind of erodes and more churches, you're going to see people kind of flocking to, um, where there are more resources. I think that's kind of the phenomenon of the mega church as well. Um, you know, people want to go where there are more people like them and where there seems to be the, uh, the appearance of success. America, you know, Americans love bigness. They equate bigness with excellence, with success. And so I just don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. In fact, I think we may see an increasing number of them. Um, the question will be, are they, will they be able to navigate some of the tricky waters that are coming, um, that are already here actually, but just sort of, uh, our pro, you know, post-Christian, um, you know, as America steps further and further into post-Christianity, um, the post-truth culture, all of that sort of thing, are they able to kind of stay afloat with those times or will they get kind of too big for their britches? But, um, I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And even globally that, I mean, there's an increasing number of mega churches as well. So the, the world has gotten smaller because of technology and globalization. And so I think the influence of them will persist. And I think the manifestation of them will persist as well. Jared, if you were to start a church tomorrow and you were to be the senior pastor of that church, and it was to start from totally a fresh template or Total, it was completely a fresh initiative. What kind of church would you plant? What would the model be? Oh, my word. Yeah, so I like the simple church model. Um, uh, I think sort of some, you know, the bare necessities would be the preaching of the word and the exalting of the Lord in song and um, communion. And if possible, plurality of, of eldership. Sometimes if you're planting a church, I planted a church and I planted as a solo pastor. Sometimes you have to begin that way, but that would be the basic model. It would be the traditional model, a gathering, um, you know, whether that's in a home or in a public space. Um, but we would have a time of singing. We would have a time of preaching, a time of giving and celebrating communion, which I think is kind of the, the you know, the regulative um, norm biblically, the irreducible elements really of, uh, of gathered worship. But then just in terms of like, the outward focus, um, I've thought about this a lot just in terms of the simple church concept, which I'm really one to, which would be that I think a church has to have a worship gathering. A church has to have a um, uh, table fellowship. So the, the, you know, that can look a million different ways, but generally the small groups of some kind, community groups that we're experiencing life on life. Um, and then that there's an outward focus of service whether that's, um, you know, justice initiatives or evangelism or a mix of, of all those things, um, uh, you know, a heart of community service, those three things, I think, um, that's what I planted with when I planted in Nashville. And if I had to do it over again, there's a lot of things I'd do different, but the model itself, I think I would stick to. Technology seems to be changing almost everything in our current world, whether it's medicine, education, should technology also change church or should churches be appropriating technology in any particular way? Is a virtual church possible? What's your view? Yeah, no, I don't think a virtual church is possible. If, um, if, if anything, it's almost a redundancy or an, or, uh, an oxymoron, I guess I should say, um, you know, because yeah, church is the body of Christ and virtual is a, uh, a disconnection. There's no tangibility there. So it doesn't mean we can't connect with other believers over, you know, the use of technology. Um, but I tend to think an uncritical use of technology in the church has been um, a deficit for us spiritually, um, that we haven't thought through the implications of things like video venues um, and even some of the use of some production techniques in, in gathered worship. I'm not as harsh on those as um, a lot of folks are, but to me, I just want churches to ask why, why would, why do we do this? 
Um, what's the purpose behind it? And to really think through um, whether kind of using a mirror to reflect back to the world itself is really a, a, an effective means of what gathered worship really is, which is to exalt the Lord. You know, sometimes those things reveal that the, 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 the uh, center of worship is actually the worshiper. We're trying to create an experience of some kind for those who are coming. And that makes them the object of worship, essentially. Um, and so it, it doesn't mean we shouldn't use technology, but we shouldn't use it uncritically. Um, and so I think in, in, in the best case scenario, the technology we use is more circumstantial, right? So you have amplification of, of, of the instruments that you're using, uh, amplification of the preaching because of the acoustics in the room or the size of the audience. Um, you're using technology to, um, to broadcast the message or just your presence, all those things to connect the people in fellowship during the week as they're not gathered together. Those are all, I think, you know, appropriate circumstantial means. It's when we begin to um, innovate and, and turn the technology into an element itself that I think we run into some trouble. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not dogmatic to say you should never use, you know, colored lights or anything like that. Um, but I just think we should ask a lot of why questions. Why do we do that? What's the purpose of turning the lights down low during worship? Um, and, and, and does our answer to that question reveal something about our view of worship, which actually isn't reflected in the scriptures? Mm -hmm. All right, Jared, I'm super grateful to be speaking with you about your book, The Gospel Driven Church, Uniting Church Growth Dreams with the Metrics of Grace. I've got to ask one more question. Sure. And uh, you, I, I may have confessed to you at this point that I'm writing a book on virtual reality church. So I'm oh, super wow. interested in your views here, Jared. So <laughs> okay. be patient with me. But okay. your church uh, has incredible vision about how the gospel transforms and moves the church. It's the heartbeat of the church. And, and that's sort of the, the what gives the church momentum as it brings its mission to the culture. In your view, would it be possible for the church uh, to disseminate that gospel message its sermon basically as a podcast, for example, and then to reserve the service time, the gathering together for the other things, singing, discussion, etc. But to actually take that that sermon piece and to route it through some other delivery system to get to the to the people. What's your view? Must the sermon be performed as a live uh, act? Yeah, it depends on what on what must means. I think ideally, yes, because the the sermon is an act of worship itself. If you, if you look at Nehemiah chapter eight, what Ezra and um, and the others are doing is they read through the book of the law and they give the sense. I think the, we have an example of kind of expositional preaching there. They're not just reading scripture; they're helping explain it. it says so that everyone can understand the word. But there's worship. The people are responding to um, what Ezra is doing. He's giving thanks to the Lord while he's preaching. It's really fascinating. And the others are responding to that. I don't think you get that kind of interaction and connection um, when you have a, a virtual um, sermon involved. Now, you can be moved, just as we can be moved by listening to preaching on podcasts and those sorts of things. But there's not the relational connection. It, it, it ceases. It, um, it's not just ceases to be a worship event, but it ceases to be a pastoral event as well. Because if I'm preaching, I can see, and I'm live, I can see the people. I can see what they're responding to or not responding to. I can look them in the eyes. Um, I can even, if I know my congregation well, which I think, you know, most pastors should, there are some, I can say their name, perhaps. I can pause if I need to pause. There's just so much, um, in terms of the tangibility, that creates a connection um, that I think is more of the essence of what Christ has done in his incarnation. And I just think with all of the problems that the church is facing and, it's, you, know, it's been, you know, and going into the future as well, that um, sort of de-incarnating the worship event or the preaching event uh, just doesn't seem wise to me. Um, I'm not prepared to say it's, sin, you know, it's a sin to do, you know, have, you know, a video you know, preaching or anything like that. I've preached at churches where they do, you know, venue, uh, uh, video venues in, sorts of, in other locations and all those sorts of things. And, and I wouldn't do that if I thought it was, you know, uh, uh, you know, a sin, you know, to experience that. I just wish we had just asked some more questions. And I also have concerns about the raising up of preachers. Um, you know, Matt Chandler, who 
uh, you know, leads one of the uh, most recognized multi-site churches, although it's, they're now spinning off their, their campuses, the village church in um, uh, uh, Flower Mound, Texas, they're spinning off their campuses into autonomous churches now. Um, he said in uh, an article about the multi-site phenomenon, the video venue phenomenon a few years ago, um, that he worried that in the future there would only be like four preachers in America and every church would just have one of those four broadcast on a screen or some other way downloaded. And, you know, he was making a joke, but there's some reality to that. Do we make preaching equivalent with a performance and, and then to say only the most talented people can do this, which is another way of saying it's really not the gospel that transforms people. It's talented preachers or, you know, gifted preachers who actually do this. Paul said, I did not come to you with eloquence. Uh, or wisdom, I came to you with the foolishness of the cross. I resolved to know nothing among you except the cross. And so I think if we believe that, uh, we'll put more effort into raising up a generation of, of preachers so that we don't have to go this other route. Even worse than just having four preachers in America, they would be distributed by Apple, Google, Microsoft. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I really appreciate your, your point there. What does this mean for the preparation of preachers? And, and uh, you, sir, serve as director of pastoral training at, of the Pastoral Training Center at Liberty Baptist Church in Kansas City. So that's part of your week-to-week -week routines is uh planning for the preparation of future ministers. What, what does all this mean? The change in church demographics, the, the technology on the horizon. What, what should theological education programs be doing now to make sure that pastors are ready for the ministry of the future? Yeah, so certainly training and preaching, um, as we just discussed, but um, I, there is also, I think, a decline in real pastoral care and meaningful care of, um, well, I mean, just the understanding of church membership in general, but uh, uh, attending to the flock. So what we see in kind of the, um, not just in the megachurch phenomenon, but e even in medium-sized churches that are trying to replicate uh, being sort of a religious resource center of, uh, of sorts, everything is built into that weekend gathering, and the experience of the church is, is basically that weekend experience, and all the energy is poured into that. And that becomes people's experience of the church. And people come in and out. You don't even know sometimes who's there. You don't know if they're disappearing. Uh, I hear, you know, horror stories all the time, which to me are horror stories of people be, who are baptized in a church. They made a profession of faith. And a year later, nobody knows where they are, you know, um, if they're still walking with the Lord, if they're in that church or another church. All, all of that, I think, spells uh, trouble for us and has for a long time. So I think part of the training and part of the training, you know, that I want to do um, both at the seminary and in our residency is um, pre prepare young men for the future as things like the new sexual revolution uh, collapses. And we have uh, uh, hordes of people who are dealing with the wreckage of, um, yeah, what we're, what we're sowing now in terms of sexual identity chaos and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but other things besides. So I, I, I was just up in British Columbia preaching at a church, and the, the church there just opened up a counseling center. They hired a, a, a fellow to come direct it. They've got, um, you, know, you know, he's a professional licensed guy. He's got some lay workers that are there. They really wondered, like, man, you know, can we get this off the ground? They have been bombarded with, uh, with needs since they opened. They, they work nonstop. All the appointments are full. I think that's going to be an increasing need and we cannot treat the church simply as a, um, a weekend production or um, a one-stop shop for your kind of spirit, you know, spiritual pick-me-ups. Uh, I think we have to train the future of ministers for the, the, um, the onslaught of personal care needs, counseling, mental health, even issues. Uh, some of those things um, are, are becoming increasingly necessary. Jared, I'm really grateful for your time this evening. And if I could close this interview with the question that we've been asking all of our interviewees on this program, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united today? How might we recognize this unity? And what is it that we can do as believers to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? Yeah, you know, on, on, on one level, um, I'm grateful that what Jesus is praying for, he's actually 
um, actualizing himself in his atoning work, um, that the church would be one as he and the father are one, right? As he says, uh, I am in them, they are in me, that they would be one just as you and I are one. And in, in, a, in, a, in the spiritual sense, that's accomplished. He has made us brothers and sisters, <laughs> whether we like it or not. <laughs> we may not get along. We may not go to the same church. But if we profess Christ and we have different views on secondary, tertiary issues, uh, but we agree on the main stuff, um, and, and we're brothers, and we're going to be in, in unity in heaven. And, and, and so by virtue of that fact, because of Christ's death and resurrection and his ascension, because we're united to him, we are actually one united to each other. The critical question is, can, will we ever get around to expressing that? <laughs> will we ever get around to some manifestation of that before he comes back? And I don't know. I think there's so much sin and so much brokenness in the world, and we are so stubborn. Um, I think if it's going to happen, it will have to be a great move of the Holy Spirit. It, it will have to be something tantamount to uh, another great awakening uh, of some kind to do that. Because what it requires is basically that we would put Christ above our preferences, our comfort, all the issues that divide us, all the things we see on social media, believers, arguing and debating over, which many times, not all the time, but many times are, are, are important things and things that we even could debate over and kind of hash out. But when we put those things above Christ, we actually stifle uh, the kind of unity I think Christ desires for us. And how we get to that, how we're going to turn those tables over, I don't know that we can. I, I think Jesus has to do it himself, which I think means that um, for it to happen would require a great move of God, um, uh, another rushing wind to kind of bring, you know, bring awe down upon every soul. It's been our huge privilege today to be speaking with Jared Wilson, Assistant Professor of Pastoral Ministry at Spurgeon College, author in residence at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Director of the Pastoral Training Center at Liberty Baptist Church in Kansas City, and also author of the text that we've been discussing today, the Gospel-Driven Church, Uniting Church Growth Dreams with the Metrics of Grace. Jared, thank you so much for Dr. your Armstrong, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it.